I have a couple housekeeping items to communicate. The presentation will be about an hour and a half long. We appreciate and encourage questions and we'll do our best to address all of them at the end of this presentation. You can go ahead and use chat to post your questions. Just know that we'll get to those at the end of, of our class. Since we have quite a number of participants, we've muted you and turned off video except for our presenters. We've shortened this presentation from an original three hour class to make it more comfortable in this virtual environment. Because of this, we may not get to every topic, but we'll do our best. The information presented here will be available on our UC Master Gardeners of El Dorado website after the class. I'll post that link in the chat, but for your information, ucanr.edu slash EDC Master Gardeners is the link. Okay, did you re respond to the poll? Let's look at the poll. Like 80, 90, 93, people are doing it. Oh, great. I'm gonna go ahead and relaunch the polling and let folks keep working on that for just another minute. So one last thing, the class is being recorded and um, we will be streaming it live on Facebook. So if you're joining us virtually on Facebook, please like, comment, invite your friends. Um, you can ask questions in the chat and we'll get to those questions as well. Okay, let's go ahead and look at that poll. I'm going to give it just another minute because it looks like lots of people are still working through the poll. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results. Okay, Hopefully you can see um, the results here, but we asked if you were a master gardener and it looks like 68% of you are not master gardeners and are joining from a county outside of Central Sierra. So that's interesting. 19% um, are not master gardeners, but live in the Central Sierra counties and a small percentage are master gardeners. That's great. Have you joined UC Master Gardeners of El Dorado for a class in the past. 77% um, are brand new, 19% have attended a virtual class. How did you hear about today's class? This is always a great question. So a lot of you heard about this um, via Nextdoor, um, blogs, Instagram, Facebook, great. Today's class is part one in a two-part series on growing winter vegetables. Do you consider yourself a novice, intermediate, or expert gardener? So 44% are new to this, 51% are intermediate gardeners, and 5% are considering themselves expert gardeners. Fantastic. There'll be something for everybody. Uh, how does your garden grow? This is your best year ever, 18%. We love to hear that. Um, ugh, just like the rest of 2020, 18%. Neck. And neck. <laughs> um, and then some things are thriving, but other things are struggling. Okay. Okay. Oops. Um, why do you garden? Pick the one that most matches your reason for gardening. Um, growing fresh, healthy food, 53%. Um, eight percent like knowing where their vegetables are raised, ten percent for self-sufficiency, and twenty-nine percent gardening the soothing, um, stress-relieving, invigorating. Love that. And then I skipped this question. I'm going to go back up to number six. I have grown a fall and winter vegetable garden before. Thirty-four percent have, sixty-four percent have not, and three percent aren't sure. So, fantastic. So with that information, that's going to help. Zach to kind of target his talk, um, knowing your experience and 
Why You Garden. So I'll turn this over to Zach Dowell. Hey folks, good morning. Thank you for being here. My, uh, let me see, I'm gonna close that. <clears throat> My name is Zach Dowell and I am a UC Master Gardener for a couple of years now, several years. I don't really know. I think I went through the, th the program in, I don't know, uh, maybe a decade ago, maybe maybe less. Anyway, um, I, I am a garden, I garden up in Georgetown and we'll talk a little bit about, because um, it looks like from the polling that there's folks from all over the place, which is really interesting and fun. The bulk of what Bulk of my comments, uh, because we're the El Dorado County Master Gardeners, are, are about El Dorado County, but I'll talk about ways that you can, you know, the, the concepts are, are very similar and just mostly the dates uh, are different, perhaps, and also what you are able to grow uh, might be a little bit different if you're somewhere um, with a slightly different climate, etc. You might be able to grow some things that are difficult for us here in El Dorado County. I'm thinking citrus, um, et cetera. So this, uh, the El Dorado County Master Gardeners is a great organization as all MG organizations um, are, we're volunteers. And I just have this, uh, in my day job, I work at Folsom Lake College, a community college in Folsom, just down the hill from this beautiful place. And so I, I really encourage you to, check out the Sherwood Demonstration Garden. It's a, it's a gem, it's a beauty of a garden. This was part of my job at the college. I run a makerspace there and, and I work with faculty to do innovation in the classroom. So one of the things we do is fly uh, giant agriculture quadcopters. And this was shot in October. I think Mary Campbell was actually on the ground in this video. Um, and down at the bottom of the screen there, perhaps you can see the footprint for, um, there's going to be a great outdoor classroom space here uh, that's going up even as we speak or in the in the state in the final stages. There's a vegetable garden, there's a butterfly garden, and it's just an absolutely beautiful thing. And it has been able to be open. Uh, there's 10 folks at a time. And so I really, if you haven't been there, uh, you got to go. And it's just up behind, if you're familiar with the county, it's up behind the El Dorado Center of Folsom Lake College, uh, up where there, there's also an observatory there. Uh, that the Rotary and, and other organizations participate in. And all that is sort of behind the El Dorado County Office of Education. So please do uh, check it out. And uh, our plant sale, when we, when we can have it, uh, funds that. So just if you're in the county, watch for that. That helps us to keep this garden. And it just is absolutely gorgeous and, and a labor of love. So. so we talked about how does your garden grow? And from the poll, let's see, how does your garden grow? How does your garden grow? There it is. Best year ever. So pretty, pretty much evenly split best year ever and ugh, just like the rest of this, uh, this year. And then the majority, however, some things are thriving and some things are struggling. And that's how my garden grows almost every year. Um, there's a, you know, in, the, in, the, in lots of, in the animal kingdom, in the plant kingdom, one of the reproductive strategies is to lay a billion eggs because only some percentage of, uh, of your babies are gonna make it or just plant a million seeds. And so that's kind of the strategy I use in gardening. Just try to get enough stuff going um, in a multi-year sense, not just a multi-season sense, but a multi-year sense to, to make it so that something's gonna work, right? Uh, because each year is different. And, and if you've gardened for any length of time, you'll find that some years disease and pests are a problem of one thing versus another. If you have perennials, you'll find some years the blueberries just take the year off. And, and that's just sort of how, uh, how gardens go. And so um, I think coming to terms with that and accepting that is a really good strategy. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about IPM. So this, this class in general, we usually run it as one uh, long session on a Saturday. And we've split it into two parts. The first half, generally speaking, is about cultural practices and understanding multi-season gardening. And the second half is uh, we get, dive down and get into the individual plants and the, um, the characteristics of each and how to choose them, et cetera. So that's kind of the flow. And one of the reasons I forgot, I guess I forgot to put in the poll, but one of the reasons that I garden is 
to grow things that are otherwise difficult to source in the market or to experiment. And uh, I'm, I'm running a multi-year food forest project on my property here in Georgetown. And this year, and I, while, while mushrooms are not plants at all, right? Uh, they diverged some number of millions of years ago from both plants and animals. Um, they do act a little bit like plants in that they can grow from the ground, et cetera. So one of the things that, that I like to share as, uh, as we're getting into this is stuff that is in my garden. So this was just a couple of weeks ago, and these are oyster mushrooms, which I grew for the first time. We're doing some work at the college in biomaterials and growing mycelium in, in forms for use in um, one of the big projects we're trying to create planting pots out of um, mycelium so that they can biodegrade and so have access to a lot of mushrooms. So I grew king oyster mushrooms. These are just out on the ground under a under a bay laurel tree, a Grecian bay laurel, not a California bay. Um, and they're growing in coconut uh, coir, the, the, the brown fuzzy part of coconuts you can buy as a planting medium. Oyster mushrooms will grow on almost anything, including, you know, cardboard and coffee grounds and basically anything. So I don't, I hate mushrooms, by the way. Um, but folks in my family like to eat them. So I also this year had really good success. So speaking of things that did well and don't, this year I had great success with um, a new crop. I've grown it one time before, Mexican sour gherkins, which are pictured there on the left. They look like tiny little watermelons and they're, they taste like tiny little cucumbers with a little bit of a sour note. And they're very prolific. So they grow uh, on, um, the vines are very delicate, uh, but the, the plant itself is really prolific. And so those are great in a salad, just cut in half or whole, and they're great for lacto fermentation. So I've fermented and put up some pickles and my nieces think they're great for dull watermelons. So, and then beets, for some reason beets, I don't have a lot of, I, I, I didn't like beets until recently. Uh, and so my beets are really good this year. So those are some things that have gone well. Tomatoes, not so good, or it's hit and miss. I've had some, a lot of pests and disease problems in certain varieties and I plant I should say a, a lot so I think I have 47 to 50 plants of 15 to 17 varietals and so some of those are have done really really well uh, and some have been diseased and problems and and I'll talk about um, selection and so forth uh, in in the coming slides so why why garden I'm going to look at the results for why you garden Let's see. So lots of people like to grow, and these were a little bit sort of like make a choice, right? I think probably for most folks, it's a combination of these things, right? Um, fresh, healthy food. That seems to be the, the winner there. I like knowing how my vegetables are raised. So this is maybe if you're oriented towards organic gardening or um, so knowing what goes into your soil and onto your plants, if anything. Self-sufficiency. So especially in these times, a lot of folks have, have picked up gardening or renew their interest in gardening as a way to uh, provide for themselves or, you know, the, in, in this county, there's a lot of steadies and um, preppers and folks that are gardening for, for reasons of, of self-sufficiency. And then we got, looks like we got a, a pretty strong contingent of soul gardeners, people who think gardening is soothing and invigorating and stress relieving. And, uh, and you're probably some on the, somewhere along there or several of those combined. As I mentioned, one of the things that I like to, to do is grow things so I'm, that, that are uh, interesting or unusual. And, and for the most part, I grow only things that you can eat. So I'm not a flower gardener. I'm not a, a Japanese maple gardener or a rose gardener. And you'll find uh, master gardeners all have specialties and specializations. And um, so I grow things that you can eat. And, but I also grow some things. Uh, so this is a Japanese Indigo, which is not the true indigo plant, but is a dye plant. So we've been doing some work at the college um, with the Asian Pacific Islander Club in dyeing, um, combining laser cutter. So there's this process called katazome, which is a, a dye resist process. And you make um, dumplings, steamed dumplings out of rice bran and glycerin and some other things. And then you apply that to fabric through a stencil that we use the laser cutter to create. And then you um, dye that and it washes right out. So similar to batik or other things, but it's really easy to get the, the resist off of the, um, there's uh, Katya making the dumplings. You make them like, honestly, like regular sort of dumplings and steam them and then you use, and then you smush them up with glycerin. So 
I've also been growing lately. We, we're doing some fermentation science work. So this is hops outside the back of, uh, uh, in a, a backyard area of the college. And so those are whatever, 16 feet high maybe. And uh, so we've been, we were able to fresh up. So if you're a brewer at all, and we were able to literally pick the hops and then put them right in the boil um, and fresh hop, a wet hop, some, some beers, um, which is, a, is really a treat. And hops will grow in El Dorado County. I have a couple of plants at home. They don't, they don't do as well maybe as in places where they're um, more inclined to do well. Sacramento is a famous hops growing region, but El Dorado County I don't think is. And then for all, if there's MGs in the crowd or aspiring plant taxonomists, um, I planted six new fruits this year. Um, I planted pawpaws, a couple of them. I planted uh, Gumis, I planted mountain ash, medlar, and uh, sea buckthorn, and maybe a couple of others. So if you're an aspiring plant taxonomist or master gardener, here's your assignment. Take a look at this leaf, fix it in your memory, and uh, go key that out and, and figure out what plant this is. It's a fruit-bearing plant. It's a tree. It's not native to California nor to uh, the United States. So see if you can figure that out, and I'll if I remember, or if you remind me, I'll tell you what that is at the end. Um, hasn't borne any fruit, obviously I put it in this year, but. So an overview of, of where we're going. We're going to talk in this first half about garden planning and management, really what, what to consider as you are putting in any garden, but with particular um, focus on, on this time right now and getting ready for a fall and winter garden. And then the second part, of the presentation, which will be in, I don't think it's next week, I think it's the week after. Uh, we'll get deeply into the the fall and winter vegetables themselves and talk about the particular cultural requirements of various things. And uh, I'll share resources. And before we go any farther, I am going to clear the screen. I can't, okay. So in my day job, I, I mentioned I'm on the faculty at Folsom Lake College, and in my day job, we talk in terms of outcomes, and, and outcomes are what we hope students do or th think or feel or how they sort of apply their learning after this experience because of this experience. So what I hope for you and the, the, my goals in doing this and our goals are to plant or expand. I hope you plant or expand a vegetable garden. Um, I hope that keeping in mind the, the things we'll talk about today that that will lead you to growing healthy and nutritious vegetables. Uh, we as the Master Gardeners hope that you will adopt IPM, that's integrated pest management. We'll talk about what that means. Strategies as you do that. And, and I hope that you share your surplus. I hope that you have a surplus and I hope that you share it. Um, in this county, we have plant a row and you perhaps you do where you are, um, which is an effort to connect garden surplus of gardeners to uh, soup kitchens and food closets and people that can benefit from donations of fresh healthy food. So that's the framing construct and the outcomes that I hope uh, that I hope happen as a result of us being here today together. And this black, I don't think I can get rid of this. I can't. Okay, so to, to do that to get there, uh, we're going to talk about location timing, soil and fertilizer, irrigation, starting seeds, and, and finally, uh, integrated pest management. That's the first part. And these are all the considerations as you go to create a garden or expand a garden. And that's the first step. And so we're going to dive right into that. Uh, please put your questions in the chat. It may, it's a little easier to just do them at the end, and so that's why we're doing it that way. Ordinarily, we just break in and have folks ask them uh, in real time, but it looks like the chat's blowing up, and so that's cool. Get get your questions in there, and then we'll have, we'll 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 at the conclusion of kind of the prepared remarks, we'll we'll answer your questions. And there's are you seeing the mis there's magical um, annotation happening on the screen. It's kind of fun. Okay, location. So again, we're the Eldorado County Master Gardeners. So when you're thinking about the, the location, you're thinking both in terms of where you're siting your garden, There's sort of three considerations, or at least three, wh where it is on your property, where you are in the world, and the season, right? And especially in this county at this uh, latitude or longitude, the 
it's the sun is very different. So there's pronounced um, seasons. The sun is very different in the sky where it sort of sits and the angles and so forth. And for many gardeners in, in El Dorado County, there's trees, there's other issues. So, but it's important to know just in term in generally, um, these are the USDA garden zones, right? So when you go to select plants, when you buy them at a nursery or when you're reading about them, or excuse me, I'm in a cough, so I'll do or when you are planting a seed packet, the plants will often, the, the, those things will often say, um, this will thrive in zone, you know, up to zone, whatever, 9A. So Placerville, sort of dead center in the middle of this, is right there in, in 9A. And what the garden zones basically are is how cold it gets, more or less. And so the average annual coldest temperature. Um, and so if you're around Placerville, you're probably in 9A. And as you head sort of to the right, sort of up into the mountains or north, you can imagine that the it gets colder, right? It's colder at altitude and it gets colder the north, northerly, northern, when you go north. And if you go to the west or south, if you're gardening in you know, parts of Amador or Sutter or Sacramento, the seasons are just a little different. And what that mostly means in a garden sense is, in particular in the context of fall and winter vegetables, is when you plant and when you can expect to harvest. Because if you live in a warmer area, it stands to reason that you can plant things sooner because you're not worried about plants, young plants being succumbing to frost and, and or you're trying to get plants to grow before that happens and that happens at different times in different parts of the county or different parts of the state or the world. So the other, um, I'm going to try one more time to clear this and then if someone knows that they're, oh yes, I did it. Okay. So the, the average annual extreme minimum temperature in Placerville is 20 to 25. It rarely gets that cold, um, but that's, that's the extreme again. And so um, these zones, by the way, shouldn't prevent you from trying to grow any, I believe, shouldn't prevent you from trying to grow anything. It's just because you can almost grow anything anywhere if you provide it the right conditions. But that might be building a little house around an avocado or moving things in pots in and out of the garage in the winter or providing sort of semi-permanent shade or exploiting a vine to cover things in the heat of summer or whatever. So I encourage you to experiment and to, to consider those guidelines for things that'll more or less grow well. But um, I think it's fun to try to, you know, grow artichokes or whatever in the, in the desert. So um, within reason, right? That, that often implies a whole bunch of water and water is a really, uh, a really important thing to consider in all of this. And we'll talk about it in particular. And there's another zone system. So the USDA zone system is uh, the one I prior mentioned, but you're probably in um, Sunset Western Garden Zone 7, more or less, if you live here, or maybe 9 going that way or 1A going up into the, um, up into the foothills or, or higher up. And so knowing which garden zone um, is listed on the plant is it's more often than not USDA, but sunset is sort of the big publication. And, and I always mention this, it's the sunset zone seven is also Oregon's Rogue River Valley. And if you've ever been to Oregon's Rogue River Valley, it's exactly like Georgetown in terms of there's madrones and it's, it's very similar um, in many, many ways. It's sort of weird to be driving through Oregon and see madrones because that's not a very common tree in, in, in many places. So So when you are selecting a site, then here are some considerations. So ideally, in, if we were, if we have a hand raised thing, can we try that? Raise your hand if you, I'm going to try this. And if it doesn't work, we'll, we just won't do it again. Raise your hand. No, can you raise your hand? No, say yes, yes. So if you look at, I want to know if you have selected a site for your fall and winter garden. So if you can indicate by answering yes or no, there's a button somewhere. And I'm not doing, oh, I see Andrea Hicks has figured out yes. So some folks are starting to figure it out. If you look at participants, you ought to be able to say yes or no. And I'm scrolling through. I see some lighting up, so some folks are figuring it out. 
A lot of yeses. A couple. Oh, I know Andrea Hicks. Um, I see a lot of hand raises, so I'm going to take those as yeses. So it looks like there's a, as they're lighting up, it looks like a predominant. Some folks haven't, some folks have. But most folks seem to have. That's just a straw poll. The site that you uh, select, these are the ideal kind of characteristics, right? And this is true for sort of any vegetable gardening, but um, here's where fall and winter and spring and summer can be a little different. And, and so you ideally want a spot that has six to eight hours of sun. Most of the things that you grow as vegetables are annuals. And they, by and large, want to grow in a season, put up a bunch of growth, do what they're going to do in terms of seeds or fruit, and then die when it gets cold. Um, not, gen not universally true, but that's kind of the general pattern, right? So if you think about a spring garden, your site is ideally level. Uh, and that's because in this, you know, you don't want it, all your hard work soil to wash away in heavy rains. Uh, you want access to water. So in this county, you've got to have, and probably where you are and anywhere basically in California, you've got to have access to water because things won't, won't more or less grow without it. And if you, depending on the size of your garden and how it lays against the land, there might be microclimates and airflow considerations, right? So cold air sinks. And so um, there are ways to, to put things on hills and mounds to get cold air to flow or to look at the way the cold air flows if you're trying to grow citrus or something in areas that are otherwise marginal or areas uh, that have shade at certain times of the day or year that don't at other times that you can exploit that if you know about it. And then accessibility. So the best gardens are those that you can access and work. And so uh, raised beds are a really great thing that many people do. They kind of get things up off the ground. So if you have back issues or mobility issues, um, you're going to be more successful if you can kind of get things up to where you can work on them. And for those folks that answered yes, you can evaluate whether these are true for the site you've selected. And for those folks that answered no, that gives you just a, a kind of something to be looking out for as you select a spot for your fall and winter or spring and summer gardens. This is my garden from many, many years ago. Uh, I don't really garden this way anywhere anymore, but I think in, in terms of, it's very important, I think, to document your, your own gardening progress or your gardening endeavors. So as I mentioned, I garden in Georgetown. My garden is uh, all told maybe 2,700 square feet. It's about a thousand square feet bigger than my house. And of that six, or 700 square feet maybe is annuals and all the rest is uh, perennials and annuity crops and blueberries and fruit trees and vines and um, stuff like that. So uh, that's, that's one way to garden and, and we talk also about containers, right? So you can garden in a little pot on a patio uh, and something that, that limits in some ways uh, things that you can do, but, but not that much. And so don't be discouraged if you don't have a giant place to garden. Um, you'll be able to be successful uh, in, in any, any season gardening. So if you notice from this picture, one thing that I notice as I'm looking at it is that <clears throat> there's this shadow right here. So there's, this, there's an oak tree that produces this shadow. I'll color in the shadow, right? And that moves, so the sun is moving uh, east to west, and that shadow kind of moves to a certain point, sort of coming towards us, and then it, it goes out of play, right? And so knowing that, one might, and so in the middle of the afternoon, that shadow might be dead center in the garden. And so I would, knowing how that works, I might choose to put or cite certain plants that like summer heat, but like appreciate um, a little afternoon shade, right? Uh, peppers is a really good example. Peppers are, um, peppers like the summer and they like the heat, but they really don't like to, to be in sort of El Dorado County sun in, in the whole day, right? And they can uh, wilt and wither and they have much softer, more tender leaves than, than things like tomatoes and other stuff that can kind of soak it all up. So that's just be, being aware of how the garden works in terms of the, the way the sun flows throughout it. And, and by the way, that's, that can be quite different in the fall and in the winter. And so uh, it's a really good idea to spend time in the place that you want to garden and really pay attention to where is the sun uh, in 
in January versus where is the sun in November versus where is the sun in the middle of August, right? These are, by the way, um, planted in blocks. I, I am more, I am mostly in raised beds now. Um, I had uh, diminishing returns. This, my garden is in a clear cut and over time, all of the native surrounding trees, which are cedars and oaks and madrones were like, oh, here's some nice organic soil with a ton of water and really rich soil. So I'm going to fill them up with roots. And so from all sides, uh, and I was watching my yields decline and um, ended up having to, you know, double, I tried double digging for years and, um, and eventually just went up <laughs> so that the roots, and even then the, the boxes get rooted out. And, um, and I've had to pull whole giant eight by four boxes up, take out all the soil, sift and screen it, lose about half of it because it's just 100% mat of roots. I guess it would be 50% mat of roots if I'm losing 50% losing and, um, and then replace the soil and then actually put down heavier barrier. So, so there's also gophers quite a bit in this part of the world and so Typically, when you do raised beds, you're putting hardware cloth, really heavy wire on the bottom. But I also had to put more or less like pool liner to keep the roots from from coming up. So, which introduces drainage issues and blah blah blah. But these are these are the, the problems we saw as we garden. Um, so there's that shadow actually. So in the near in the near field here, um, this is a shadow. That. Um, this is a summer garden and you can see there's uh, shallots or something down here, but just knowing where that stuff is, is, is uh, it can be important or you can exploit that. Timing. So timing is a really critical piece for those of you that are multi-season gardeners and those of you aspiring to be multi-season gardeners and maybe you didn't even know, there were a couple of people that didn't know and that's a good answer um, because in fact, we, we separate this into spring and summer and fall and winter, but there are actually sort of lots of little windows and pockets and seasons, but those are sort of the general categories. Um, and so knowing when to plant and what things thrive in what conditions is really critical. And the way that we do that in the MGs is we use this planting chart, this very planting chart. And, and it shows, and these are available. I think Tracy said that she's gonna put some information in the chat if you wanna get one from this, this um, county. This is um, we make these available in a nice laminated format. I've got several of them. I keep one by the computer so I can buy seeds. I keep one in the greenhouse. And they really help you to get your head around multi-season gardening. So this side is the spring and summer, and that's where we are right now, right? So if you look at the January, um, we are seeding in this county for um, a whole bunch of stuff that is very early spring. So the way the chart works is that uh, here, is where you are planting seeds. And then um, here's where you can expect, so in, in the case of broccoli, we're planting seeds in January through February. We can expect plants in March. And then we can expect our main cropping to be um, in May and June. So that would be sort of a spring vegetable. And, and at broccoli and its ilk, actually I like to grow them um, seed them sooner and, and grow them sort of now. But, but anyway, um, and then if you look at seeding fe in February and March and having plants for tomatoes in April and May, and then you're, you're having tomatoes from June all the way in some cases through December. Um, the same is more or less true of peppers and beets and other things. And then the full, full summer vegetables where you're seeding, mostly direct seeding. If you look down in the chart, there's corn, which you're mostly putting just in the ground in May and June but all the way through July and, um, and things like zucchini, which you typically can plant right in the ground um, when the soils are warm. So that's the spring and summer version. The one we're talking about today and, and in the next section of this class is this one that's on the screen. And so, um, so if you look at this chart, it starts with July and, and goes, it's July to July. And <clears throat> I do, but I can't. Oh, here we go. Let's try that. So July to July. So in July, we would have been seeding for Brussels sprouts and rutabaga. Uh, we're in August right now. And, and this, by the way, if, you, if we're in the middle of August, but if you 
if you want to try seeding for Brussels sprouts and rutabaga, I, I encourage you to do that. Um, these are really guidelines and they're pegged for Placerville. And if you have the actual chart, it gives you a little bit of a formula to slip the dates forward or back to pace, depending on whether you're higher up, in which case you have a shorter season, right? And colder sooner or lower down, in which case it's warmer sooner and, uh, and doesn't get as cold. So um, the chart, when you, when you get one from the Master Gardener office and we're normally open, um, has the, the way to slip those dates. Uh, so these again are, are plasterville. My dates are quite a little bit, you know, I'm up at 3000 feet even uh, in Georgetown. But so right now we're in August and we're seeding, right? We're seeding for things like cabbages and broccoli and cauliflower. Some of which we, most of those will expect to, they will overwinter, right? And so if you look at the harvest for broccoli, we're seeding now for it and expecting to eat it in November, December, and January. So here's one sort of general characteristic. The plants that we're planting as fall and winter are much more cold hardy, generally speaking, and can stand under snow, right? Bro broccoli is perfectly fine to be covered with snow. Um, doesn't snow a lot here in Georgetown, but it does snow every year. Broccoli is fine with that and can sit under snow and can sit in cold. And in fact, some of the things like mm, collards and other stuff get sweeter after a frost or a snow. Um, and some things we're, we're seeding now, carrots you generally seed direct, we'll talk about that, and expecting to not to, to eat them until February, you know, um, January, February, March. And then some things, there's a big window uh, in October in this county where we're planting things that can last all the way through July, right? And so uh, garlic is the big one. And I spend a lot of time in the next session talking about garlic. It's one of my favorite things to grow, uh, but you're putting that in in October and you're not expecting to harvest until at, here at my house, uh, the scapes come up, which are the garlic flowers that you can eat and honor about May 20, May 20th. And then you're pulling the garlic out maybe July 4th or June 20th, excuse me. May 20th escapes by July 4th for the actual garlic. And so, so knowing that, here, one of the reasons that this chart is really great is it allows you to, if you have limited space, you sometimes have to plan ahead, right? So. I have to know where my garlic is going to go and I can't have all my beds full in October still waiting for um, things from the summer. That sometimes brings the tragic situation that you have to pull up tomatoes <laughs> before they're, I'm one of those gardeners and maybe you are too, that um, is like cheering for those green tomatoes in December. I know they're going to get right. And, uh, and so you have to kind of plan ahead or to keep a bed um, separate and sort of in a rotation and those kinds of things. So. I encourage you to check out this. If you don't live in El Dorado County, master gardeners from all over the state and probably all over the world have similar planting charts. Um, and the, the varieties and stuff are more or less going to be the same or the plants, but the dates are going to be perhaps a little different. So I encourage you to check that out. And I encourage you to start, as you start to multi-season garden, you start to really understand the rhythms of the garden. This is rhubarb and rhubarb is one of the things that comes up. That's when I know spring is like right on the cusp, rhubarb and, and asparagus, they'll pop up, um, you know, in early April, sometimes, uh, sometimes earlier, sometimes later. And so um, that's a perennial that indicates to me um, the rhythm of my garden and what's happening and when spring is about to appear. So in terms of planning, it's really important to plan a garden, as I mentioned, in terms of knowing what the space is, but also knowing um, keeping good records, knowing what you planted and when. Crop rotation is important. Um, a crop is a kind of a misnomer there. R rotating, it's not a good idea, generally speaking, to plant the same thing in the same place year after year after year after year after year. After year. Um, for a couple of reasons, um, pests and disease pressures can build up in the soil in that place and you'll eventually see declines based on, on diseases of plants. And if you think about plants, they like what they like, right? And so corn is a huge heavy feeder because it's growing a giant, um, body in a short amount of time. So it loves nitrogen. Tomatoes are the same way. And so if you keep the same plant in the same way, you can in the same place, you can imagine that the plant is going to take from the soil each year what it wants and you might end up deficiency with deficiency. So um, there's lots of ways to, to think about uh, crop or plant rotation and, and you'll, you'll hear about following things with uh, following corn with peas and those kinds of stuff. So knowing the growing habits of the plant when you're planting a bed um, and and knowing what the irrigation needs, grouping plants that have like irrigation. Irrigation is less of an issue in fall and winter gardens, but uh, and certainly more in spring and summer, but it's something to keep in mind. 
here is a garden plan. Um, for this is how I used to garden. So this is not this is pre beds this is when I was doing rows. But what you'll notice in this is I have onions and gardens, garlic on the left and asparagus on the right. Asparagus is a perennial, meaning it goes in the ground and it stays there for 15 or 20 years if you're lucky. And so and onions and garlic take a long time. You're planting in October and you're not eating them till July. And so Knowing that and how those plants sort of lay out against the season, you can put them out at the edges. Asparagus is also, by the way, a six, seven foot plant, right? And so knowing what the final form of the plant looks like allows you to place that in the garden in ways that you're not going to shade out things that you don't want to shade out, for instance. And so, and you, neither do you want to put asparagus in the middle of, uh, in the middle of an area where its roots are going to get disturbed, and neither do you want to do what I've done here, which is to plant garlic, you know, in the middle of everything, which just makes it harder to get around and lay out irrigation and till and all those things. Less of an issue now if you're in raised beds, but this was not good planning on my part because then I had to individually kind of run the tiller around and leave the garlic in the middle of the garden. Um, so thinking about soils and fertilizers, which are the life support system of the plant. Here's the kind of thing that you need to know. And if you've gardened for any length of time, you've probably seen these numbers, uh, and particularly the NPK, which is what you'll see on a fertilizer uh, bag or box. And so plants like a neutral to slightly acid soil, generally, most plants, there are, there are exceptions. Uh, fortunately, most soils sort of trend that way anyway. And so um, many folks love to, I did too, I don't worry about it anymore, but I used to, I got a soil test, like that was my big thing when I, when I gardening up here, I was like, I got to get a soil test and really know what the pH of my soil is, um, which is fine. And that's fun to do. Uh, if you add organic matter and if you uh, treat your soil as a living organism and, and treat it as a, a something that you're working on all the time, it's going to trend that way mostly anyway. NPK is the, the three things in a really reductionist way what plants need, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The quick way to think about that is um, shoots, roots, and fruits right? And so nitrogen is for green leafy, gro leafy growth and um, uh, phosphorus for roots and potassium for fruits, generally speaking. So shoots, roots, and fruits. Um, if you look at any fertilizer container, bag, box, or liquid, I should mention I'm an organic gardener, so I only use uh, organic um, things in my garden, of which there are plenty, so it's not an issue. Um, but there on the, on the, on the bottle of BioLink organic all-purpose fertilizer is a 333. So that's a what we'd call a sort of a low balanced uh, fertilizer. It's got even amounts of the three and in low, in low numbers. Those can be skyrocketing numbers, right? Stuff, you know, um, nitrogen fertilizers in particular, you can get like sort of super nitrogen stuff, but uh, you have to be careful with that. So, so but generally when you say well, a balanced fertilizer is going to be something like a three up to maybe a 10 or whatever, a 10 to 10 or a, um, to it. So in my garden, I mix those up in, in either five gallon or actually larger bucks, uh, like a big old, whatever that 33 gallon or 50 gallon blue drum. Um, I don't do a whole lot of fertilizing to be quite honest. I'll tell you about how I think about my soil, which is how I sort of manage fertility, but, um, Animal manures, if you have access, are wonderful. In particular, rabbit. Rabbit's one of the best barnyard manures, and you got a nice closed system there, right? You're feeding um, those carrots that you can't wait to check to see if they're ready, and they aren't. Um, you feed those to the rabbit, you get a, a result. Composting, and if you have ducks, ducks are great at turning compost and adding to compost. Some folks are, if you're not from a rural county, these are there's lots of things you can do. And master gardeners in every county teach a lot of classes about uh, vermicompost or vermiculture. And we have, I think Cindy's here, we have experts in that um, even in the room. So uh, you can do that on a small scale, you can do that on a large scale and a kitchen scrap scale. You can do post hole composting. There's a million ways you can sort of build soil fertility if you don't have access to piles and piles of manure. Compost is a really good way to do that. It adds uh, organic material to the soil, it lightens up soils, it adds nutrition, it creates environments for fungi and other beneficials, um, water retention, there's a million reasons why it's important and really good. You can do that in piles on the ground, you can do that. I, did, I have this tumbler that I inherited 
Uh, it doesn't work great, uh, to be honest. Um, I just mostly pile stuff. Lately, I've been using a chipper shred. So I pile it for whatever, six months. I chipper shred it to, to get kind of uniform particle size. And then I finish it in a, in a smaller version of this, which is sort of a, that I found on the side of the road, a, one of those plastic tumblers. And that actually works pretty well as a finisher. And then the compost, you know, heats up really hot, kills pathogens, breaks down even more and turns into that really crumbly black, that really nice um, spongy material. And then I uh, add that to the garden. Or if you're, if you're gardening at scale, you can, cover cropping is a really good, good way to go. Cover cropping just means planting things, um, a mix usually of legumes and bell, uh, this is bee, um, bell beans, field peas, vetch, um, and, and an annual rye, so cayuse, oats, and rye. But basically you're growing things in place and then chopping them up at, to add to soil fertility. So I mentioned this in this class because October is a really good time to plant a cover crop. So this was that garden you saw from several pictures back. That was, I, I did it all to like cleaned it all out and planted this cover crop in October, um, usually before October 31st, when in the old days it used to rain invariably in Georgetown by October 31st. That's not true anymore, but um, it was true for, you know, the prior decade or so. And so, so that I didn't have to water this. And so these, um, all of these seeds germinate and start to grow and then it snows or gets really cold, they stall out. So they get to be this high, they stall out, they get covered in snow, they're fine. And then they, the minute the snow melts or the minute there's a little bit of warmth, they shoot up to waist higher, higher. And the legumes do this really great thing where they take um, atmospheric nitrogen uh, and fix it in a plant available form in these nodules on their roots with uh, nitrifying bacteria. So legumes are things like uh, peas and beans. And actually there's some, some there's a uh, bear clover, Kedizzi is a, a native of this part of California that's a non-leguminous nitrogen fixer. And there are tons of things in the pea family, all, everything in the pea family does this, including bad stuff like um, scotch broom. And there's lots of things that there are even trees that do um, this kind of nitrogen fixing. But in my case, it's the bell beans and the field peas that, and the vetch that do this. And so that, yeah, so those are the roots. And then you just, you get a kid to chop it all up and um, a couple weeks before you're intending to plant into that. So I should mention, this would be, you would be doing this in October in a couple months in preparation for a spring and summer bed. So if you have an area that you want to, especially if you have an area that you want to start using and you haven't before, get some, get a mixed, uh, a mixed soil builder mix or, or buy, you can buy this mix, right? A mix of seeds, or you can kind of make it up. Um, and plant some in October for that spot because you'll get roots down into the soil and you'll you'll start to get these beneficial um, organisms moving in and tilling up that soil for you and kind of sweetening it up and then in the spring two to three weeks before you're going to plant into it you chop it all up into fine particles you till it all in uh, either by hand or with a with a troy built horse or similar and then you wait a couple of weeks and you turn El Dorado County soils are sort of notoriously red and weathered and clay-like and gnarly. And so um, over years of doing this, you can kind of open up your soils and add a bunch of organic material uh, to really help stuff out. I ended up, as I mentioned, having to double dig, which is not, it's, it's hard work. That's where you sort of dig down and then you dig down, you take that soil, move it till at the bottom of this to try and get rid of those roots. Uh, it's a lot of work. Um, and I eventually had to sort of abandon the in-ground as a strategy at all. Um, but, you know, I learned something. One thing I, I like to stress is that you really should think about your soil as an organism and, and feed your soil, not your plants. It's a whole lot easier to build soil and to think every year, what am I doing for the soil? What am I going to do to get the soil to be um, uh, better? And, and rather than thinking, oh, uh, I need to add a bunch of fertilizer or I have all these pests and disease problems. Good soils, you know, plants that are healthy are generally going to repel pests and diseases. Irrigation, as I mentioned, is, is just watering, right? Um, this is, a, you know, the UC, the, the best way to water is drip. It's the most efficient. It puts the water where it needs to be. It's the most sort of granular in terms of knowing what plants need what water. Uh, most gardeners that I know do some combination of drip, hand watering, and sprinklers. 
This was less than a week ago at a, about 8,000 feet in Desolation Wilderness. This is up above Lake Lois on the Red Peak Stock Trail. So there's still a little bit of snow in the local mountains, um, I was pleased to note, um, even though this year was a little bit, it was certainly dry. There was also a little bit of a uh, grouse up there at that same elevation. Um, but you're gonna have to water and that's less, it's in for fall and winter vegetables, depending on where you live, that's usually in, in the first part, right? When they're germinating and first growing and then you probably don't after, you know, when the rains start. So November 1st and beyond. Um, and so starting seeds is an economical way to get started in gardening. Um, you can go to your local seed bank. This is a Folsom Lake College Seed Library. The Eldorado County Master Gardeners have them or your local library might also. Um, this is just where you go and quote unquote borrow seeds and grow them and then if they're you're successful you return seeds and these are all going to be open pollinated um, more or less heirloom varieties that that are not hybrids right because um, we don't are going to get deep into seeds but hybrids don't produce um, true seeds um, there are great sources um, you can get really esoteric seed sources like seed savers exchange um, which is people, families that have saved seeds since whatever, the 1800s. Um, so the deeper you get into wanting to grow, uh, you can also just go down to your local anything and pick up, um, pick up seeds. Um, you should look for, if you can, there are lots of places that have local seed companies. So those are varieties that are going to work well in your location. So you can, um, Sierra Seeds is a neat project out of, uh, up out of Grass Valley, Nevada City, that does some interesting work in preserving seeds from and other things from the mining era. Seeds need things to consider when you're when you're growing, um, starting from seed, soil, temperature, water, and air, right? Soil is a little bit of a misnomer. You mostly don't grow seeds in soil per se. You grow them in a, some kind of a mix, um, which typically contains fir bark, um, perlite, and sand, or it can be peat and perlite and sand, or you can just go down to the, the orange big box store, or the blue big box store, and buy a seed starting mix. Be aware that if you're an organic gardener, some of those contain non-organic sources of nitrogen. Um, but the things that trigger seeds to, to germinate is usually temperature. That's kind of the big one. Um, and they need water. They need to be moist, but not drowning. So air is sort of the flip side of that. So you typically um, water them until the soil surface or the growing media surface is about to dry out. And then you, um, then you water again because otherwise they're going to be water both waterlogged and starved for air. I'm going to skip over this. This is just using uh, 18 molar sulfuric acid to scarify uh, elderberry seeds. Um, but you can grow in 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 um, you know sterilized uh, uh, planting pots. Wash those out and use a one to ten um, bleach solution to kind of get rid of any fungi. Fill them up. Plant your seeds. Put them in a sunny window or a, this is an impromptu greenhouse made of a jewelry display case with a sliding glass door. It actually got to be about 210 degrees in there as greenhouses are mostly too hot for lots of things, especially if you're planting as we're doing now um, for spring and summer. So I germinate my fall and winter stuff outdoors in a shaded nursery or dappled shade nursery um, area of my garden. That's my greenhouse with a hat over it so it doesn't get crushed by snow. It's also a rain barn. Um, or you can build little kind of on the ground. Uh, this is like a little mini greenhouse. Um, seeds need light. So once they've germinated, they really need light. Otherwise they stretch and they're, they're gonna get leggy like these tomatoes, which are a little too long for the fact that they haven't, they don't have any true leaves yet, right? So these are the seed leaves, the little first leaves. And, um, and they're just a little too long. These are much better examples. They have some supplemental light. Um, so these, again, you're planting in whatever, February and, and um, at my house, they need some supplemental light at that time of year to get, because you want it to be stout and really leafy um, with short stems and stalks. Uh, that's just a speedling tray. The speedling tray is kind of a more of a commercial nursery thing, although you can buy them and it makes nice plug. So they're sort of inverted four-sided pyramids that you're packing uh, soil in and, and germinating and they make these really nice plantable plugs. That's a sorrel um, for out in the garden. So let's talk a little bit about pests and diseases. You're probably familiar with this if you've ever gardened anywhere. These are aphids uh, infesting a mustard plant. The UC approach to, to thinking about pests and diseases is something called IPM, Integrated Pest Management. 
and it really involves prevention, right? So healthy plants can repel passive diseases and you will grow healthy plants by considering all the things we just talked about, having the good soils, the right um, water, plants at the right time of year, thinking of your soil as an organism, spending time in your garden. Because, and then if you have a problem and you will have a problem, being truly understanding what it is, right? Identifying it and knowing what it is that's causing the problem uh, most people know that these are aphids, but if you didn't, those are aphids. <laughs> I know this because I've gardened and, and you've seen them, but they're on the, usually on the underside of leaves, and we learned in Master Gardener training, you can truly identify them by these cornicles, so you get out your Master Gardener hand lens and, and say these are aphids. And then what do you do about that? Aphids are really easy. You wash them off with a hose. That's about it. Um, and, and really in IPM, you want to control in the way that is the least... Um, the least toxic. So in the old days, it was broad spectrum insecticide sprayed on everything. And that's, we don't garden that way anymore. And that's not good for the earth. It's not good for the garden. So picking things off, excluding things, accepting damage. We talked about soul gardening in the beginning and, and knowing that your plants are going to suffer from something and just being okay with that. Because even, you know, everyone has the blossom and rot of tomatoes is a big issue that comes up every year. And people are like, my tomatoes all have blossom and rot. And mine do too. And, and no amount of, you know, putting milk on them or anything else is going to solve that in this season usually. And mostly the plants grow out of it. After that first flush of fruit, they've solved their problem, which has to do with calcium and transpiration of water and fast growing tissues or whatever. Um, but it's just mostly something that if you, you can try to add calcium in the soil for next year, and you can just accept that there's going to be three or four tomatoes that just have that soft watery spot on the bottom each year. And then using things that are less toxic um, if you must use things. And if you must use chemicals or want to use chemicals, knowing that they are for reading the, the thing and, and knowing what they're for, knowing how soon to harvest, you have to wait because you don't want to be eating that stuff, et cetera. So that's kind of the, the, the quick hit on, on what integrated pest management is about. Here's just a little IPM story. Um, I was getting this problem of leaves, most broadly plants. That's a sunflower, but it was happening to everything from morning glories to squash. And this was actually a photo from this morning. Uh, a similar um, skeletonized leaves. This is a mountain ash, which is a fruit bearing plant that I have out in my food forest. Um, just getting decimated by something. Uh, in the prior case, it's, it's finches, right? And so there's not a lot you can do about finches. And in fact, you probably don't, don't want to do a lot about finches. You want bugs and, and insects in your garden and birds, excuse me. And um, so no amount of chemicals are going to do anything to the finches except make them sick perhaps. But um, if you have madrones, I'm, and I wish I could see your faces or, or show of hands, but it's just, it doesn't quite work as well in Zoom, but the madrones are just getting hammered by these little caterpillars that are, they're webbing things up and they're, um, they're fuzzy little sort of beige colored caterpillars. And those are what were causing the problem on the, the mountain ash. And so the problem, knowing what your adversary is the point there and knowing if it's birds and if you really must, you'd exclude them with bird netting versus knowing caterpillars and, and um, excluding them by putting BT or, or less toxic, uh, using less toxic things or hand picking them off in the case of like large insects, right? Um, that's just about rats. I thought I, I, uh, I thought it was birds uh, eating my strawberries, but it turns out it was rats. And right, this, this bird netting is not going to exclude it, the rats. And what it's going to do is actually kill lizards and snakes and everything else. So um, really just understanding. And that, that comes from spending time in the garden. It comes from uh, experience. It comes from calling the master gardeners. And, and you, can, you, can, um, you can either call the office or you can, um, you can look at the resources, the uh, UC IPM resources that I'll share at the end uh, and, and say, I'm having this problem with my tomatoes. Here are the, the six most common things and here's how you would deal with them. Uh, that's just my blueberries, uh, which I originally put chicken wire and that kept the gross beaks out, but not the finches. So I had to put a second layer of wire to keep the, all the birds from eating all my blueberries. And they'll get in there anyway, and they panic, uh, right? They get in, they can't get out. And I want to wring their little necks, but I don't. I let them out, but they don't realize that I'm acting on their behalf. So people always ask on these about deer. Um, really, fencing is the only... Uh, reliable way to exclude deer. There are deer resistant plants, which are really just plants that deer like less than other plants. I've had deer eat walnut. So this is a little fortress I had to create around a walnut tree. Walnuts are notoriously um, kind of allelopathic. They, they 
um, they kill everything around them based on compounds in their leaves and roots. Um, and so they're very, and they're very like, if you crush them up, they have a quite an intense smell, uh, but deer will eat them. And so in our county, that's bear damage. Bears, there's not much you can do about bears. They come in and eat the compost and the rabbit food, not the rabbit, but the rabbit food. But what you want by, uh, by using EPM or IPM and adopting it as a strategy, you want these kinds of scenes in your garden. You want ladybugs, and in particular, you want the young form of ladybugs, um, the larval stages, uh, because they'll eat the uh, aphids. And you want to have bees pollinating your squash. And you want to have um, California king snakes eating your meadow voles, right? And so you're just trying to think about, I, I encourage you to think about your garden as an ecosystem and um, this is a beautiful snake, a big, beautiful snake. Uh, we have both California kings and mountain kings that are a little bit different. The mountain kings have red and they look a little bit like coral snakes. But. So that kind of is the, the, the setup. And, uh, and in part two, we're gonna go into the specifics and, and we'll talk about, I, I'll mention varieties that I like or other master gardeners like for this county. Uh, and we'll talk about leaf crops. Um, one thing I, you'll, you may notice about this list, things that you grow in fall and winter are typically grown for their leaves and flowers and roots. And things that are grown for spring and summer, generally speaking, are grown for their fruits, their fruiting bodies, right? The things that hold seeds, right? So if you think about spring and summer, that's tomatoes and peppers. And if you think about fall and winter, it's lettuce and collard greens and um, broccoli, which is an immature flower. and roots and then onions, which are sort of bulbous uh, stem things. So I think at this point, uh, we're at an hour and we want to answer questions. So I'm going to stop my sharing and um, and I don't know, Tracy, how do we handle, what do we do now? I guess I would ask. I'm going to let Mary ask some of the questions out of chat and then invite uh, those that are viewing if you have questions to just post them in the chat and we will try to get to them. Okay, so far I've got uh, question one. In El Dorado County, should veggies be started from seeds or from starts? Yes, and I would say. Um, some, you'll get a greater variety of, of plants from seed, right? Because the, the stores, even a really good nursery, will only have so many varieties of fall and winter vegetables. So uh, it's a great place to start to just go buy a six pack when they're available, because they're typically available when, um, when they're ready to go. And then uh, as you expand or as you want to sort of explore different varieties or, or sub varieties, or um, if you need, you know, broccolini or rather than just regular old broccoli, you might have to go with seeds. And if you are starting and you think you've missed the windows, because um, seeds take, seeds can take a long time, but I got to tell you, I germinated some seeds. I put them in, I think two days ago for um, three or four kinds of kale and some red, giant red mustard. And they popped up in two days, which is crazy. Um, it's crazy fast. Uh, so it's a yes, a yes and. And if you can't find the things you need, you'll have to go to seed. And if you're a little late in the season, you can go ahead and pick up plants. And then there are certain things that uh, I'll talk about in the next time. Um, uh, you can grow, for instance, asparagus from seed, but it adds a whole year. Asparagus is unique in that it, it, you're, it takes like three years to start harvesting. So um, growing it from seed adds a year because it takes it a year to get from seed to the point where you would just buy starts essentially um, at bare root time. So, so it's, a, it's a yes and, I would say. Second question. Uh, someone has spider mites on basil. Uh, yeah. I need to know what to use to control. We also so, posted a link to the IBM page uh, in the chat for the individual to look at. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Spider mites are, are one of the perennial favorites, right? Aphids and spider mites are the two almost every year. And, uh, and so the way that I deal with spider mites, so insecticidal soap, which is a perfectly um, benign compound um, will get to them and it you have to be on it though so one of the things about IPM is uh, integrated pest really um, being in the garden all the time and kind of keeping on top of things is it's a whole lot easier to solve problems before they get 
the level of infestation that my green beans are right now with spider mites and I was a little lax um, in dealing with them. So there's a couple of things. If you have them now, insecticidal soap will work really well, you, but you have to be, you have to like keep doing it. And, and a lot of pests and insects will be on the underside of leaves. So you sort of have to soak the leaves. And for basil, because you're actually eating the leaf, I'm not sure I wouldn't just prune that out and hope that, uh, and then keep on top of it and hope that the new growth doesn't get them because the insecticidal soap doesn't wash them off, it just kills them. So your basil is gonna be covered in spider mites and probably not so great. Um, so that's a tough one. I, they don't go to basil in my garden. Um, they go to green beans, they go to uh, tomatoes in particular. So another, another practice, and again, this wouldn't be relevant for basil, is to, um, in, in tomatoes, for instance, I prune them so that there aren't any leaves touching the ground and, or any uh, branches uh, because it's harder for spider mites to kind of go up one highway than six or seven vectors up onto the plant. So garden practices uh, about pruning can help, uh, again, ahead of time. Um, and then there are a lot of pests and diseases where you, you want to be careful with the, if you're at the end of the season, right? Some of the, if you unless you're doing, you're really good at composting and doing hot composting, um, in particular disease tissues, you're going to want to keep those out of your compost stream uh, because you don't want to perpetuate that um, year after year. So, but the, the short answer is insecticidal soap is the best, uh, the best actual control for spider mites. It's a tough one though. Basil's tough because the, the, the plants themselves are what you're eating. So. Hey, Zach, we're getting lots of questions in. Next one is, when should we plant asparagus and rhubarb for the first time in El Dorado County? Outstanding question. Uh, we're going to go deep into that topic. Um, prepare your bed now. So figure out the spot and, and figure out a spot that you, you can live with for 15 years. Okay. And then um, you plant them when they're available. And they'll be available as bare root, uh, when bare root season is usually, or a couple of weeks into. So if you look at when nurseries start to get bare root trees, um, they'll also have um, starts for asparagus and rhubarb and artichoke and horseradish and other things. And so you can pretty much put them in the ground when you can get them. Uh, okay. So that'll be December, January usually. But you wanna prepare the bed now because you don't wanna be walking around working in wet soils, which compacts them and kind of wrecks soil structure. So think about it now, start your pre preparation now. And you're gonna wanna add phosphorus. I'll talk a, a little bit deeper about that, but they're because they're perennial, they're in that spot for years. So you wanna give them a really good start and have a rich organic soil with all the be there for years and produce. Zach, when you say you'll talk about you'll talk about that a little bit more, that will be in session two, which is on uh, September fifth, correct? Uh, I I'm going to say yes, although I don't have my calendar in front of me, but I'm sure that's right because it's not this coming Saturday. It's, it's the one after that. Yeah. Okay. Next question: Can I put asparagus with artichokes since they're both perennial? They're I, I I I. Ooh, I wouldn't, and here's why. I mean, you can put them near each other, but um, so sort of in alternate, I wouldn't intermingle them, I guess I would say, because asparagus will start to spread, uh, which is good, right? That's what you want. And the spears will come up in places that you might not have foreseen, although they mostly hang around where the crown that you plant. Um, so I, I would think of, yes, in the sort of grand sense, if you prepare a big bed for them, as long as you're kind of the, the the asparagus out on this side of the bed and the, the artichokes are on that side of the bed because neither one are you disturbing the roots when you harvest either of those things you're not kind of getting into the soil and damaging the roots of one or the other you're taking either or this the immature stock so I'd put them in the same bed just not intermingled I guess if it were me okay next question uh, when if we use manure should we do that each gardening season or several times during the planting season? Well, that's a good question. So manure is an interesting one because um, manure can have high salt content. It can be super, um, if it's sort of uncured, as it were, it can be super nitrogeny. So here's, here's how I deal with manure. If you can get it, especially if you can get it in quantity. Um, I pile it up and, uh, and after say a year or depending on conditions and how moist it stays, when there are, when I drive my hands into the manure pile and there are worms gr inside of it and weeds growing on top of it, I feel like it's ready to go. That's just kind of a really um, uh, 
just experiential way of thinking about when to use it. And so I, I have done both. You can use it uh, to till into to beds and you can use it as a side dressing, right? Which is where you put it sort of scratch it in or surround um, almost as a mulch. Um, you got to be careful of seeds a little bit. Some manures are like just full of seeds and, and can give you a lot of weed problems. But what you, what you want to be careful about is that, that salt concentration kind of thing, right? So if you're using exclusively manure over long periods of time in the same place, you can um, end up with a situation where the, you get some salts and things in, that are going to um, result in your plants being less, uh, less able to do what they need to do. So I would, if, especially if it's a new bed, I would go for it, till it in and use it uh, as a side dressing, um, but just don't go, don't go, don't, don't go nuts on it, I guess. <laughs> okay. In <That's>, moderation. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I cut you off on that. Oh, no, that's good. When do you chop up the cover crop? So uh, the cover crop, it needs to be chopped and integrated into the soil at least two weeks. And usually depending on, and it sort of depends on the heat, right? It depends on the soils there. Because what you want to do is break down. And what you don't want to do is bury a bunch of green material and then plant right into it. And the reason is all the bacteria that are in the soil right then will try really hard to break down the green material. And so you'll end up with this uh, nitrogen deficit situation in the near term. And so you really want to give it two weeks in a, in a warm kind of if spring is early and warm, um, at least two weeks before you want to plant into that bed, you chop that up, till it in, and then wait two weeks. And hopefully in that time, it'll, it'll get sort of digested by the soil. If you're, if you're just starting out or you're not sure, or it's just not a very warm spring, um, do it three weeks, four weeks, um, and chop it up till it in. And so a month before you're planting out. I plant out on Mother's Day. So I, depending on where you are, you know, your planting dates are maybe different, but Mother's Day is when I put stuff in the ground. So I'd back up four weeks from that or three weeks or two weeks. I mean, if it's a super hot spring, it's gonna happen faster, right? Because the soil's warmer and there's more activity. Okay, if you only have one raised bread, bed, excuse me, can you plant cool season crops with the cover crop in the same bed? Or should you just plant the crop, cover crop by itself? That's a good question. Uh, Let's see, I would have to, let's see, so if you're chopping, if you're intending to also use that bed for spring and summer, let's imagine that you are planting, let's say broccoli. So you're seeding broccoli into that bed and you're pulling it out in February. And the same time you're pulling it out, you're cover cropping and chopping it up. Cause when's Mother's Day? First of April, first of May, 9th of May, something like that. I, I don't know when Mother's Day, I'm not good at that. Don't tell my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You probably could. Yeah, you probably could. Um, for, for most things, not obviously onions and garlic and things that need to be in the ground a lot longer, but um, as long as also they don't, the cover crop grows kind of weedy. So as long as it doesn't choke out, you might have to subdivide the bed or you might have to really pay attention, but they're not going to be, they're not going to compete. I wouldn't, I shouldn't think too much for, for soil nutrition and you could probably mix those things up and then chop the whole business down when it's time to harvest the kale and then wait two weeks or three weeks and then plant it over to, to spring and summer stuff. Should work. Check your calendar. All right. Uh, there was some discussion in, in the chat session about awesome and rot, calcium and uh, inconsistent watering. Uh, probably not a bad idea for you to expand just a little bit on that. Yeah. So, so blossom and rot, I, I have a picture in the spring and summer one, but it's that that wet patch that's sort of the, the bottom part of a tomato on the blossom end, uh, it gets funky. It can be gray and awful looking. It'll sometimes heal up and scab over. The tomatoes themselves will be fine as long as they don't rot in bacterial ways after the fact. So you can pick those tomatoes and cut off the bad parts. There's nothing wrong with eating the rest of the good tomato. And blossom end rot is a complex phenomenon having to do with calcium and fast growing tissues and water and water moving within a plant that's growing fast. It is sort of a nutshell way to say it. And so a deficit of calcium in the soil is going to cause a problem that can be compounded by inconsistent or not the right water, either too much or too little or too infrequently. And I, I just have to be honest. And then you'll see a bunch of folk remedies like, oh, spray them with milk and stuff. I don't think none of that stuff is UC um, uh, 
So what when we when we say master gardener stuff, it's stuff that the UC has tested and is research based. And so, to my knowledge, none of that stuff is actually um, tested to be uh, beneficial. But soil calcium is. So if you have blossom end rot, you can try and add. But again, it's probably gonna not gonna you're not gonna get to it in time for this season, right? So you need to be thinking about next year when I plant tomatoes, uh, that soil I'm gonna put uh, enrich it with calcium, with eggshells, with um, oyster flour with whatever things have calcium. And then I'm gonna get on a really good regularized watering program, which again, depends on the soil. So people always asking these like how often and how much, and that really depends on your soil and how it handles water. Um, and so a little bit's trial and error. And I gotta tell you, I do all that stuff and I've been gardening for, I think going on 30 years. And every year I get blossom and rot in, in particular plum tomatoes. And it's the first couple of fruits. And then it's the plant works itself out, right? Cause it's, Again, it has to do with fast growing tissues. And so fruits are fast growing tissues and it just works itself out. So it's something I just learned to live with and cut off the bad parts and then try harder to remember, which I never do to add calcium to the soil for next year, so. Okay, let's see. Hey, I have broccoli that doesn't flower. Uh, any ideas on why, any tips to overcome that? Huh. Let's see. So I've never experienced that. So here, here'd be my strategy. So one thing we learn as master gardeners is that there's tons of stuff that we don't have any idea about or that has never, we've never experienced. So, so we learn strategies and one of the strategies is to consult. Um, the first things I think of are, are you growing it in season, right? So we're not in any sort of broccoli season right now. Um, we would have we would have been growing broccoli in harvesting in May or June and not again harvesting until November December. So the first thing I would ask is to where and that's again El Dorado County, so it could could be different where you are. So I'd be thinking about is it growing in the right season? And then the second thing I would do is I would go to the VRIC. Uh, if someone would be so kind, uh, MGs of posting posting the VRIC website uh, in the chat, and that's the Vegetable Resource Information whatever C stands for. And it and there'll be broccoli for the home gardener. And there's a one sheet or a two sheet um, that says here are the problems of broccoli. And one of those problems might be my broccoli doesn't flower. What is the issue? I'd look at soil fertility. Um, so that would be NP. That'd be the K shoots, roots, and fruits. Yeah. So I'd. Oh no, um, it wouldn't be. I'm sorry. I'm thinking that's not a. It's not a fruit at all. Um, uh, I'd be. I'd be looking at soil fertility and and whether there's a kind of a balanced nutrition in the soil so that the plant is uh, flowering. And then I'd look at that VRIC and see if there's a there's a, an issue that they mention, uh, and there might be some uh, some remedy there. So that'd be how I'd think through the problem. Next question: Do raised beds get less weeds than in-ground beds? It's a good question. Uh, it sort of depends on whether the weeds are blowing in or whether they're in the soil. So if if you have a nice long-term weed load in a new soil that you're starting a garden. There's probably seeds in that soil that have been waiting for years to, uh, for you to till them up and water them. And um, when you're doing raised beds, you're starting, typically you're starting with soil that you're bringing in, either in bags or, or by the truck load or the, the skip loader load. And so, yeah, usually, initially. Um, and then if you have a lot, a lot of sort of seeds that are getting there via blowing uh, blowing, then it's either or. But in my garden in particular, I almost never get weeds in my raised beds at all ever because um, I started with sort of quote unquote clean soil and I don't have a lot of, I don't know what kind of seeds blow into beds, but they don't, doesn't happen in mine. So yeah, weeding is not even an issue. I never even, it's a good question. I never ever think about weeding. <laughs> it's not even part of my life. Um, so that must mean that the raised beds are, are, are working for an anti-weeding. Okay, uh, next statement or question. I try to use water to spray off aphids, but some then some of my plants get mildew. Any suggestions? Wow. Yeah, so um, insecticidal soap will go to aphids too. It'll get, get rid of them. Um, so you can sort of drown them in insecticidal soap. What happens with insecticidal soap, it kind of gets into their, it just they they for lack of they just asphyxiate and drown so you could you could use that which allows you to do it less right or using less water um, mildew is often an, an issue of um of when you do it right so leaves don't want to be wet for 
a lot of leaf kind of mildews and things are because the leaves are wet for a particular amount of time. So if you wait, for instance, um, late in the day and you, wa and you wet the leaves and they don't have time to dry out before the sun goes down, that means they stay wet from the time you water through the night. And then the dew point at night, they're going to get wet anyway from the natural um, moisture in the air. And so then they're wet through the morning until noon or whatever. And so that's usually, it's, it's often a timing issue. Um, so that's why watering, like overhead watering or, or spraying is often a good idea either in the night or in the morning because the plants are going to be wet anyway or more inclined to be wet if there's dew in the air. And then they have all day to dry out before they get wet again. So I would try to just either use insecticidal soap or I would try to, and, and if you're already doing that sort of in the morning and it's already happening, um, then you can look again at the V-RIC or, or um, take a picture and contact the master gardener and say, I'm having this problem. Um, with annuals, leak, things like mildew and uh, powdery mildew in particular, right, which is a big problem of squash and of grapes and of almost anything in the summer. The problem with annuals in particular is that you have whatever, 60, 90 days, 120 days. And by the time things get that, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. That's why I, I was saying about blossom and rot. It's, it's, it's almost like think about what, how you're going to sort of prevent it next season, because by the time this season, you're not going to get rid of powdery mildew. Um, you can try sulfur and you can try certain things, but um, you can also try just tearing out the zucchini, right, which gets covered in powdery mildew. And by that time, you're really sick of zucchini. Um, so I would, I, would think of, I would think about when you're doing it and then um, maybe consult the VRIC for other, uh, other uh, suggestions. Let's see. Um, can you plant veggies under espalier fruit trees? Yeah, um, some of them are going to be happier than others. Um, I I use um, yeah. I have I have veggies and herbs under a lot of fruit trees. I grow epazote and um, even garlic and other stuff. And it really all just depends on light, more or less light and water. So you don't want to put something um, that needs a whole bunch of water if you're not, if you're doing some dry, dry fruit tree farming or whether you're watering those um, intermittently. So you don't want to sort of have them up against the, the trunk of the fruit tree and then do a whole lot of watering unless that's your fruit trees are accustomed to that. And then it just really has to do with light. So there's tons of plants and in particular fall and winter stuff that is very much more forgiving of light. If you think about the season in which kale is growing, it's getting different wavelengths and temperatures and, and angles of light than, you know, a full sun summer tomato. So I would experiment, um, and in particular things you don't have to water a lot, uh, but keep them out away from the, the trunk. And, and again, it really just depends on how big the canopy is, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I don't think it's going to hurt anything uh, as long as you keep those things in mind, and it, and it might give you a, a great place to put in a few vegetables that you, um, that you otherwise wouldn't have an opportunity to grow. So. We're getting close to the end, but there's still quite a few questions. Uh, what are your thoughts on sub-irrigation raised beds? Wow. Uh, I think that's super neat. Um, uh, I wonder if that's covered in our, our uh, MG irrigation class. Um, I believe it is. Uh, and so I would, I would sort of uh, look to those folks to to get the, the skinny. I haven't done it myself. I'm interested in, in sort of all kinds of ways to, um, I'm a reformed hand waterer. Um, and, and I only got into drip, uh, let's say three or four seasons ago, not counting soaker hoses. So I sort of was hand water overhead. I went to soaker hoses and then, cause I don't know why I was afraid of drip. It's really not that hard. It's a lot easier now than it was even 10 years ago. Uh, it's really super easy and really, really flexible. It's a lot of plastic, which I, I'm not in love with. Um, but, but so I'm, I, I like the idea of, of sub watering raised beds and I, I don't know much about it. So I'd go to the, I'd go to the MG, um, class on that and see if they, see what they have to say. There have been classes on irrigation that have been put on by the master gardeners in El Dorado County previously. Uh, the presentations for those usually can be found on our website under classes, and then you can drill down to that. Next and I will, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was going to add something, but I'll add it next week or two weeks from now. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, can I place a raised bed on concrete or do I need to remove the concrete before adding a raised bed? 
Uh, you probably can. It depends on a couple of things. You'll get a bunch of staining. So if it's concrete that you love, um, um, it'll, you know, the water will wash out the bottom and you'll get a bunch of staining. Uh, it, so if that's a consideration, it, it may or may not be. And it depends again on how tall it is, I guess. Um, so you, you definitely can. Um, the water's got to go someplace. And, it, and if you're watering correctly, it'll go out the bottom and then that'll run down the concrete. So if it's a beautiful patio or something, you, that might be something to think about. Because you don't, what you don't want is to make a bucket, basically. The water's got to go somewhere. Otherwise, you'll get really um, funky anaerobic soil down at the bottom of that bed that's not good for anything and it stinks, et cetera. So, um, and, it, it, and if it's probably, let's see. I, and and taking up the concrete, you you will get if you're in a place like me, you will eventually get tree roots and everything else coming up through that soil and into those raised beds, which could be a long-term problem. So uh, it, again, it's kind of a yes and. Either way, it'll work, um, and it just sort of depends on the consequences after the fact, either the staining consequence or the rooting in consequence. So minor on on bare soil, and in fact, a little bit subgrade because of the way the land lies. So. All right, uh, next question. What do you recommend uh, to use as a ground cover between seasons? Um, so I, uh, I look for, uh, we, uh, we MGs aren't allowed to stay where, but I look for something called a soil builder mix, um, which I order from um, a, a reputable nursery, organic nursery locally. And it's a mix of bell beans, field peas, cayuse oats, vetch, and uh, an annual rye. So, and you can make, make it up. Really, the three components are, or the two, com well, three components. You all, they always have vetch. So I would, if you want to make one up, just get some vetch seeds, some, some cayuse oats or rye, some annual grass, right? Because that provides a structure for the climbing stuff to go up. And some kind of a, a, a bell beans or field peas or even uh, favas, if you can get fava beans, um, the small kind of the, more like the livestocky kind. Um, I, I would mix it up with those two or three components, an annual grass, a legume, and they just always seem to have vetch, which is also a legume. So I like what's going on right now. It's, we're, uh, it's like inception. Oh, it's done. <laughs> but the video was going back into time. It's freaking me out. Okay. There's been a... I have to apologize for the um, the duplicate screens. I think that's because we're streaming on Facebook. We are right at 1029. So what I wanna do is just thank folks for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Zach, for presenting virtually. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, this class will be posted after um, today. I'll post it Monday morning on the UCCE Master Gardeners of El Dorado County website. And uh, we will see you for um, class two on um, September 5th at 9 a.m. And we will also stream this live on Facebook. So I'll go ahead and put the link to our website in the chat if you want to grab that and uh, paste it into your browser. You'll have access under documents and presentations for um, today's class and you can review it, share it with your friends um, and we'll see you on September 5th. Tracy, this is me. There are still are, uh, some questions that have not been answered. Uh, I've, I've captured them and I'll send them on to Zach and perhaps if uh, there's time in the second session, we can respond to those. Great, Great. thank you. And I Excellent. thank everyone for your time and attention and I thank the MGs, both uh, identified hosts and those, I know there's some folks in the audience, I think, and also there's folks that I know from work. So if you're one of those folks, hi, thank you. And thanks everyone for your time and attention. I look forward to continuing this conversation in two weeks, right? Two weeks, we'll see you then. Thanks so much.